Hello and welcome to Newspeak, the New Culture Forum's weekly look at the news agenda. That's dominated by one thing and one thing alone. I think you'll agree with me this week. But before um, we go on to that, uh, just a few things, just a few notices. Uh, the first one is that our locals uh, is hugely expanding. I'm pleased to say we were most recently in Leeds. Now we are going to be in Hull. We're in Hull on Tuesday, October the 24th. Tuesday, October the 24th. So if you are in Hull or in the surrounding area, or indeed if you're not and you want to join us, please do come along. The best way to find out details, in fact, the only way, uh, is to email us at locals at newcultureforum.org.uk. So do hope to see you there. They're great events and i um, very excited about them. One other thing, actually, and that is just um, I want to say thank you because this week we passed 200,000 subscribers to this channel um, and uh, wouldn't have done that without the loyalty of people like you watching. Uh, thank you very, very much from all of us uh, for that. Uh, onwards and upwards. Uh, right, back to the business of the week. I'm um, joined, very pleased to say, as usual, uh, by our senior fellows, Rafe hadelman Koo, uh, historian, royal commentator, Dr. Philip Kisley from Leeds University, cultural historian, and Aman Bogal, who is the co-founder of Global Britain Centre. Mm. Um, he spoke at our conference recently and he's joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Um, I mentioned the one subject but actually when you're talking about what's happening in Israel and Gaza um, I think more than any other time in this particular with this particular issue mm. uh, it has actually splintered into many issues mm. uh, many of the things in fact we talk about on the <coughs> show but I want to start therefore right up to date we're recording this on the Wednesday Wednesday the 18th of October and uh, what has emerged is that the BBC, as you probably know, went very heavy on a report mm. of a hospital being bombed, 500 people killed, uh, basically by the Israelis. This has proved actually not to be the case. Mm. Um, Rafe, this really is an egregious jumping to judgment, isn't it, on the part of the BBC? Well, it's a remarkable breach of its own code of conduct and its own policy to verify things through more than one source. I mean, that's the, the basis, and that's what it's always criticising other outlets for not doing. And, and here it's caught with, with its pants down. I mean, the speed with which the, uh, the Hamas um, terrorists released the statement blaming this on on, on the Israelis far too quickly for them to have even had their own investigation and so the speed with which they did, they said it was Israel and the speed with which it was picked up not just by the BBC it should be said but by, by others as well was, was, was truly remarkable and I think immediately gives you a, a clear insight into their preconceived mm. notions about all of this about their pre about their pre-existing biases I think this needs to there needs to be an inquiry into into how this was allowed to get away with because you even had senior BBC correspondents mm. who are regional experts experts who were on television at the, in, the mo in the hours after the after the bombing saying that this was highly likely to be an Israeli attack because the size of the fire was mm -hmm. without any evidence to substantiate mm -hmm. that uh, but going purely upon their own speculation and I thought gosh yeah. this is a time of old when you need to have caution yeah. because of the of the unforeseen consequences from this and of course we've seen them now uh, President Biden is in is in the region the meeting that he had planned in Jordan the summit meeting with other Arab heads of state has been cancelled because of outrage over this bombing because they believed it to be Israel then again we've seen the most vi uh, hateful vi vitriol being spewed on social media and elsewhere mm -hmm. people even like Chris Williamson the disgraced pro-Palestine and Labour MP uh, who was called for the for the eradication of the state yeah. of Israel on the basis of this yeah. of, the, of, the, of this allegation by by uh, by Hamas now it must be said we still don't know what the cause is so uh, I'm not saying it definitely was Hamas either the point is we don't know there's more evidence evidence coming in to suggest yeah. it was a Hamas misfiring or, or not Hamas rather but a Palestinian misfiring by another organization but we simply don't know and cooler heads should prevail and the whole purpose of the BBC is to provide that 
coolness of of, yeah. of rationality and and you know sober second thought and everything, and they've completely failed on this. It, and it's a it's a, a, a dishonest journalism. I mean, there are so many things here in, in in this just one story, as you as you say, Peter. It fractures and fractures and fractures. I mean. It's the, the press, and, and it wasn't just the BBC, it was lots of, and lots of press outlets immediately jumping on this. And this was the oldest prejudice in the world, wasn't it? It was Israelis. Actually, it wasn't Israel. it was Jews killing children. It was the blood libel. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they went for it without checking. They take, you know, a Hamas press release as gospel. This is a prescribed terrorist organization who do nothing but lie, torture, kill and rape. Okay, they take that as gospel and anything the uh, IDF say, anything the Israelis say, that the, the democratically elected government is just taken, you know, oh, it, it needs to be checked. We, we cannot do this. It, it, it's, it's, it needs to be double checked. It's a double standard and it speaks of a very deep root anti-semitism in the progressive mindset and we know that the, the, the woke progressives who run the BBC and, and run all of the mainstream uh, uh, media outlets are actually fairly deeply anti-semitic. I mean the thing is Arne, I mean I, 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 it seems to me I, I still am sort of shocked that what is it, a week ago when mm -hmm. the attacks originally happened on Israel is that you would think they hadn't we hadn't had any attacks on Israel. Mm. When, if you were to, a Martian, you were to calm down yeah. now, you'd think, well, what's happening? It seems to have entirely disappeared. You know? It has. And I think, uh, Peter, I think recently, in the last few months, the BBC launched this thing called the BBC Fact Check Service. Mm. Oh, Verify. Yes. A very BBC Verify. I think yeah. uh, at this rate, we will have to uh, demand the BBC launches a BBC Re-Verify Service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the bottom line here, I think, is that the BBC has gone from a globally trusted British institution of mm. calibre mm. to transforming into this sort of metropolitan liberal le leftist elite, mm. which is made up of uh, the largest readership of The Guardian, mm. made up mostly of, of ex Al Jazeera activist journalists and people who have this axe to grind against, be it Israel, be it India, be it Trump, be it Boris, be it Brexit. So there's a theme there, and the theme is very simple, that the leftist activists masquerading, I think, as journalists, yeah, yeah. have taken over the, 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 this very august, formerly august organization, the BBC, and turned it into what I tweeted earlier, yeah. the Bakwas Broadcasting Corporation, which translates into Hindi as Nonsense Broadcasting yeah. Corporation. Yes, and yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. Um, there is no verification. They have an extra grind. And it is so, so, so obvious that what agenda that is trying to push. Yeah. And the really worrying thing about this is it isn't just the BBC, it isn't the media, that just the media, the BBC pretty much speaks for all the institutions. And especially mm. I'm mm. thinking about the universities mm. here. Remember, in, uh, I just said this a, a, a couple of days ago on the television, remember in 2020 when everybody was taking the knee, you know, who's, who's actually talking about that atrocity mm. last Saturday now, mm -hmm. you know, it's just a few of us. We are still talking about that. Jews are still talking about that. Everybody else, it's not about the atrocity, it's about the Israeli retaliation. But do you think actually the damage is done? I mean, we are pretty much tuned into this all the time, right? So, mm -hmm. but do you think that having done that, having put that out as the BBC have, do you, do you think that the damage is people will now stick with that narrative in their minds? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, this is the it, problem, isn't it? It's it is, definitely it is. going to be the case, but I mean, it's, ju it's just the latest episode in a long story. We, we, we've had stories like this over the past, all, over the whole week, and there'll be further stories on this in the weeks to come, just to portray holding the Israelis to a higher standard mm. than they're holding the, the Palestinians to. Uh, and what's interesting, actually, is you know, you're quite right. This is through all, throughout all institutions, but in America, the media have actually been far more pro-Palestinian than in the past. Mm -hmm. Now that's an interesting mm -hmm. change, and that. That's an evidence, I think, of the woke mind virus sweeping across the Anglosphere because you could you would have expected more balance historically yeah. from the American media, yeah. and that and that's not and that's not uh, in, in evidence either here. So I, I th oh yeah, it's, it's a disgraceful situation. Uh, do, do you think actually that um, people say, oh, can it come back from this? You know, you see, us, well, of course it will. You know, it, it will because it always does. But I, I mean, to me, it's sort of. You know, it, frankly, it's a sort of, it's such a breach yeah. in such an important time mm. that in fact there should be some serious consideration about 
the actual existence of the BBC. That's how I feel about it. it it's anyway. appalling to us and it's appalling to our viewers. But yesterday there was a, 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 an open letter, I think, what was it, 2,000 signatories, lovies, mm. uh, led and by Steve Coogan. Was that, was that yes, right? That's yeah. right yeah. Uh, so all of those people, and, and they are talking about Israeli war crimes, mm, mm. you know? So this blip, as far as they're concerned with the BBC, they'll just pass, pass it mm, by mm. because they're not interested <coughs> in what's happening. They're interested in an ideology and it literally is anything to promote type A at the expense mm. of type B. and mm. and truth doesn't matter that's right and they simply don't see it I mean in the past when they get things wrong they eat themselves up I mean the BBC are, gr are famous for mm. you know internalizing everything and being so self-analytical about their faults none of that has been visible upon this issue but that's what's really telling they haven't apologized they're just deflecting and they're just trying to brush things away mm. whereas in the past you know they'll have the horsehair shirt out and I think that's telling mm. and you see it also with the this attempt by John Simpson and others mm. to go in loop to, you know, to, to, to try to go around the bush and find every loophole to avoid mm. cause, calling Hamas terrorists mm. when they're happy to call the shooter in Brussels this week a terrorist, a terrorist for example. Yeah. Mm. Well, no, I think, I think it's simply the time, uh, the BBC is no longer, I think, has, hasn't been for quite some time in line with the British people. Mm. Mm. We saw it over the years of Brexit, we saw it over uh, the goings on over the, o over the pandemic. I think the BBC has lost its touch with the British people. Mm. I think the fact that we are still forced at the cost of being sent to jail mm. 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 Uh, to fund this mm. uh, mm. corporation, I think it, it has to end. We have to, I think, finally say defund the BBC. Mm. They have to be able to compete. And I think I'm a great believer in the free market, Peter. Mm. And I think if they were made to compete mm. in what people want to watch and what people want to see, yeah. I think the answer will be very clear in a very short time. The only problem is, of course, is that you alluded to, this, is that the BBC informs everything. So, in fact, Sky haven't exactly covered themselves in glory yes. over this. Yes, yes, um, yes. I saw an interview with is Anna Botting, uh, where she was talking to um, an Israeli minister actually mm. on Sky, and it was an in, it wasn't just an interrogation. It was she was she was reacting to him as though she were a politician arguing mm, mm. Mm, mm. you know and this is you're watching this you think what, what is actually sort of going well, on I, th I think uh, Peter on a lot of Sky News um, articles you, the first line you may read is uh, I think they write you can trust Sky News to tell the story mm. or, or something yes, along those lines yes. and I think the fact they have to say that <laughs> if well, you can trust Sky News to get it wrong yeah. in, their, yes. in the old days when it first started their, 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 their motto the joke was their motto was breaking rumour so I think that, you but know, of course you know, Sky in this country is no longer owned by Rupert no, Murdoch it's been no. taken over by the Discovery Network in America and I think and it's become mm. extremely woke and the, the transformation mm. of Sky over the last decade mm. into this extremely left wing organisation has been quite a sight to behold but uh, what, I, what I would say on the, on the, on the, the other issue is that um, <coughs> you know, I, was I was watching the Today programme or listening to it on the radio earlier this month and there's a degree of uh, head in the sand that the BBC have they simply don't realise how disconnected they are to go on to your point with the British public you know the Today programme the flagship of the, of the BBC has such a declining viewership mm -hmm. and when they inter when Nick Robertson was, was asked about this he said oh it's because people don't want to hear the news yeah. yes they do of course. they don't want to hear biased news you know yes, they yes. want to hear proper news and that's where you've got vast numbers going over to GB news where yeah. they're getting what they think is a more balanced view that's why people are hemorrhaging away from the BBC not because of any lack of interest and the failure of them to understand that is the root of the problem do you know so it's, what's, uh, it's, it's actually gone unremarked during this separate by Peter Hitchens I'm um, glad he brought it up uh, the BBC did an internal report into the way that they uh, report on the Middle East and mm. Israel um, some 20 years ago and it was buried wasn't and it? it was buried yeah and they've they've spent a lot of money keeping it out of the public domain right, yeah. so obviously you know and if you even go away from this issue for a minute people like you know Andrew Marr or um, people such as that will eventually you know they'll have a flash of, of kind of truth and mm. they will say yes of course it's it's a liberal mindset yeah. and that's what the BBC 
is well, but the I most telling thing I think is now now that we have podcasts mm -hmm. where ex BBC presenters are going on to give us their views we can really see that fully for what how you know, John yeah. Sopel and Emily Maitlis have their news agents oh, God, yeah. you know, just think of Paul Mason right Paul Mason 10-15 years ago was one of the main economics correspondents yeah. you can't yeah. get more Corbynite Marxist than this chap mm. you know yeah. Lewis Goodall as well got a, a former Labour uh, you know advisor became a Newsnight presenter is now there with Emily Maitlis and John Sopel it's so evident and who do they always say oh well you've got you know Andrew Neil well yes but it, you know Andrew Marr was handing out Trotsky magazines as a student you know George Galloway <laughs> revealed you know and now yeah. he's got his own show showing also how left wing he was and there's something <laughs> else there's something else about the legacy media as well isn't it you know the, the setup of the BBC you know listening to the D Today programme in the morning uh, if you do listen to the D Today programme in the morning they're only reporting on the stuff we were tweeting about 18 hours before you mm. know what I mean and and they're, 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 I know they're looking at our stuff and and spinning it in a different way because they just they just look at the news agenda from mm. a whole load of people on both sides on, on on Twitter and that's what they present. But I think I think the rot goes far deeper than just the BBC. I think yeah. so many of it's legacy. Uh, yeah. legacy institutions. I mean, you look, look at some of the uh, the professors coming out of mainstream universities, both in the US and UK, mm. giving mm. an absolute rabid statements regarding Israel and Palestine. Mm. And you think these people are in charge of teaching the next generation. Mm. There's one guy, wasn't there? Where was it now? Was it Princeton or Harvard? Harvard, he, I think, he's yeah. giving a tw He's giving a speech getting really worked up outside he was outside in the yeah. grounds of the and you know this is as you say uh, sort of pretty much endemic in our education yeah. upper higher education well you know I've, I've been in, in and around the education system for the last week or so while this has been happening um, and the one question I've been asking myself over and over again bearing in mind what happened three years ago with George Floyd where the, where the whole sector stopped now I'm asking myself after after Saturday where's the outrage Mm, Where's mm, the outrage? Mm, what are people saying? Absolute silence. Mm, Nothing. There's me and one or two other people talking about it. And everybody else has been silent. Everybody, the first couple of days, everybody was silent up until the uh, Israeli response. Mm, and then people started uh, talking yeah. about proportionality. Oh, yes. And the, and the former president of Harvard University yeah. has condemned Harvard, which is, yeah. goes out of its way to issue statements for any, yeah. any international yeah, tragedy yeah. or any conflict and has been completely silent on this issue. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I think there's, a, just before we leave the BBC part, I doubt this will come back actually to BBC in the programme, but uh, there was also an incident that they chose to actually not really report very much. Uh, which was where uh, this man in Hartlepool was killed. Yeah. Yes, the Thames was Seventy was stabbed, yes. 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 And by an asylum seeker, uh, refugee, whatever you like, young man, um, not been here that long, free house, free everything. Fresh off a boat. Yeah, yep. and then had killed this 70 year old. But they sort of chose not to really highlight something which e you could say even 20 or 10 years ago would have been probably. Uh, a headline, and I think they had to after the two the t attack in Sweden and the, is in Belgium as well. Mm -hmm. Belgium, yes. Now, well, well, just moving on from the media coverage, with the the general expressions of anti-Semitism, I will be honest with you. For, uh, for when it came to Gaza and and the Middle Eastern problem, I used to think, oh, but the people who are really pro uh, p p Palestine, they're not really. A I never thought they were really anti-Semitic. Mm. Um, you know, uh, now I sort of feel, wait a minute, mm. actually, when you saw the scenes of that demonstration, which I think will live on in shame, actually, for me, that demonstration mm. last week, well, uh, where people, the one guy with an Israeli flag, as you, uh, yes, outside King Charles out, Street. Yes, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Was you know they would have torn him to pieces in the, unless the police had been there actually wouldn't they i mean the one thing that was very very certain the one thing we got from from those uh, demonstrations on on over the weekend it wasn't just saturday it was over the weekend it was sunday wasn't it um it wasn't about israel it wasn't about palestine it was about jews Mm. It was about Jews. It was it was Jew hate. It was anti-Semitic, and what, as I've said this week, we we've got this problem, and it's from a particular community. As I said we're not allowed to mm. talk about it, but there mm. are great swathes of the Muslim community in this country, which is a big community and it's growing, who who hate Jews, who are aggressively anti-Semitic, and the problem is that's a big enough problem. The problem is 
nobody wants to do anything about it. Nobody mm -hmm. wanted to re report that uh, atrocity that yeah, you're just yeah, talking yeah, about. Yeah. Oh, do we have to do it? They're, they're kicking and screaming, reporting it. Nobody wants to do anything about having uh, a stage erected next to the cenotaph yeah, yeah. Uh, with with uh, terrorist slogans on it and mm. and, 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 Jeremy Corbyn. and Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> yes. Nobody mm. wants to do anything about yeah. it. Everybody just wants to keep quiet and everyone's a bit embarrassed and it feels as though we need to assert our identity and if we don't assert our identity now there's a real danger that we're going to be lost i think you know sorry before you come in there just just one more that point about the cenotaph for mm. example uh the same thing happened with uh just stop oil uh they got right up to the cenotaph uh, a, a couple of years ago uh the point is never underestimate as well the sheer stupidity of people who plan these things mm. it would be the police and civil servants it wouldn't occur to them that there's something special about the Senate stuff. Yeah. They sort of say, yeah. really? Yeah. They would sort of say, oh, yeah, well, oh, actually, that would work quite well. No one is going to stand there and sort of say, well, do you think actually we should really do it right by the cenotaph, you know, glorious dead, etc.? You know, it wouldn't just sort of occur because they are so completely disconnected from their own kind of culture. Yeah. This is the problem. I mean, that, that's the point in a nutshell. That, yeah. That's the absolute But let's point. not discount the left's anti-Semitism. Mm. I mean, the anti-Semitism has such a long history with the left mm. and they don't view the, the Jewish people as being oppre uh, 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 oppressed, rather they are the oppressor in their eyes. And of course, there's the historic connection that they always make with between Jews and big business. And mm. and there's nothing that 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 the left hate more than capitalism. Mm. And when the, the oldest anti-Semitic trope, of course, is that Jews control big business and that's the root cause of the left's hatred that's why Jeremy Corbyn got trapped with liking cartoons mm. and so forth mm. which portrayed that sort of Rothschildian conspiracy mm. Mm. about global domination yeah. but look this absolutely is all about anti-semitism it's not so much about about the plight of the of the, of the Palestinian mm. people and look I'm not saying Israel is completely clean this is not a black and white argument no, there's no. a lot of great Israel's done a lot of bad things towards the Palestinian peoples too but let's not think that all those people marching give two hoots really about mm. Palestine this is this is anti Jewish hatred. If there were, you know, there are so many millions of people in the world who are suffering. There are only two million people in Palestine, and it's a tiny sliver of land. Mm -hmm. The fact that people get so exercised about, I think, what is, what does somebody from Cornwall care about Palestine more than something happening elsewhere in the world, or the Northern mm -hmm. Ireland conflict? Mm -hmm. The fact that they're choosing this one tiny issue where the Jewish people are involved tells you all that you need to know. Where were the, the Muslim protests when Saudi Arabia was condemned by the UN for human rights abuses mm -hmm. and the murder? of children for bombing Yemen where were the Muslims in, in the crowds when we had the, the Iranians being brutalized by the Iranian state for protesting last year and where were they when we have every other atrocity when, when Syria was savagely waging war on its own people where were the Muslim protests on the streets there this is all down to hatred of, of Jews and hatred of the West when Muslims yeah. kill other Muslims the left and the Islamic uh, groups are all silent on this issue it's despicable that's, that's so. exactly my, my, my question a ref to a lot of people who have been protesting over the last two weeks mm. is over the well I think just before the uh, events uh, of Hamas terror in Israel we had uh, the announcement by the Pakistanis of the exp of forced expulsion of nearly I think a million mm. Afghan refugees yeah actual refugees who mm. have been fleeing mm. uh, Taliban terror mm. where were they then mm. are those mm. not people who are who are suffering mm. uh, but as as you said ref I think a lot of this is a, a case of hijacking by a lot of the Islamists mm. of, as you said earlier, it is Jew hatred, it is mm. anti-Semitism mm. rather than being pro-refugee or pro-people who are being uh, harassed and uh, intimidated around the world. What is the actual response being? What's the response been of the Islamic world? Actually? Well, I think I think I think I think look at look at it this way. Um, you've had I think uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, the, the center of the Islamic world quite mooted, quite mm. balanced in its, it, in, in, mm. in its statement. Um, whereas you look at the United Arab Emirates, mm -hmm. pretty much standing with condemning uh, Hamas terror uh, activities in Israel that we saw over the last two weeks. Uh, look at Indonesia, the biggest Islamic, most populous Islamic nation in the world. Yeah. Uh, you haven't seen the same type of street protests as you've seen in London mm -hmm. and Paris mm -hmm. and, and, and the West. And that, I think that in itself tells you a story. Look mm. at the Egyptians, mm -hmm. look at the Jordanians, look, mm. at, look at people around Palestine and Israel. Mm. 
have the Egyptians opened up their gates for Palestinian refugees from no. Gaza? No, they haven't. And they haven't done so for a reason, because they don't want to let in Hamas. Huh? Because everything that Hamas touches turns into absolute dust. Mm -hmm. And it's for a reason. I mean, look, look at the glowing success stories of the Middle East. And the biggest one is the UAE. Mm -hmm. And they have done so with millions of uh, foreign citizens from the inner subcontinent, mm -hmm. trying to integrate people together mm -hmm. into creating economic success. Mm -hmm. Not what Hamas and the Iranians want, mm -hmm. which is a theocratic fascist state. Mm -hmm. And I think so many of our commentators and politicos <coughs> in the West do not simply understand that. Maybe they're too scared to, 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 to rise up and say, look, you know, this is not exactly what we ought to be allowing on our streets. Mm -hmm. And in terms of whether it is uh, emboldening our free democracy or mm. you know that our, our multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy, it is not a multicultural democracy. It can never be a free multicultural democracy. Uh, but but yeah. just I mean, just talking about letting people in. We we heard uh, was it today or, or yesterday that the Scottish First Minister talk about that? not learning the lessons of multicultural the Scottish First Minister is saying please let's let's take in Palestinians bring them into your homes you know um, I was just talking to Jewish friends about this today and they're just saying oh no please please no which adds to one further point that that we were just talking about before yes it's about anti-semitism and yes that's a real driving factor I think there's another driving factor and it's actually power mm. naked power mm. they they were tasting a little bit of power on the street mm. those protesters mm. weren't they mm. and they liked it uh, mm. and the kind of intimidation uh, and and suggested violence you know we're going to see a lot more of that because they like it they like the way it feels but of course we know historically you know that arab states have been very quick to condemn israel and you know support marches in the streets and so forth and yet haven't opened the doors to yeah. palestinians i mean if palestinian refugees are going to go anywhere they should be going to the neighboring countries yeah. all those countries that are allegedly their allies famously silent on this issue and egypt's Not a very Aberdeen. good yeah, yeah. and egypt, egypt's a very good point here you know you hear owen jones and you know ash Sarkar saying oh well palestine's an open-air prison yeah, well, pr prisons have walls on all sides. One of those walls is actually Egypt. And the fact that they haven't made a single mm. comment about why is Egypt not doing more. I mean, Israel's got, a, I mean, Egypt's got a lot of, of uh, refugees living there at the yeah. moment. Mm. Okay, two million may be a lot to come in, but they could easily have those people, people open up, have humanitarian aid going in. And all the country, all the Muslim countries of the Arab world, particularly the Sunni ones, because Palestine is Sunni, with all of their billions and trillions of, of wealth, could easily have brought in infrastructure and made life much more livable in that open air prison over the last 10 or 15 years. The fact that they doesn't just shows you the fact that this really isn't about Palestine. Yes, well, it's not about Palestine. Yes, uh, for reasons I think, you know, that you, you've alluded to there as well. I think a lot of it, as you said, a lot of it as well is it's the kind of position that a West hater will take. Mm. It's the kind of position that a, a cultural self-loather yeah. will take. Yeah. And that is what comes through all of this. And mm. that really brings us to the third part of this, which is people were looking at this and thinking, what is, what, what is this telling us about this country? Now, just only a week before, I think it was a week before, Suella Braverman had made this speech about how multiculturalism was uh, a failure. It treated as though this was some new heresy it's been said many times before and by conservative uh, prime ministers as well um but she said this and then so we had this sort of scenes on our streets where you had people um and then you had this kind of strange amalgamation as well with black lives matter mm. and it became very clear people it's, it's suddenly and douglas put it beautifully douglas murray when he said um you know when a, a flare goes up everyone is basically yeah. lit up and sh sure enough you saw that you sort of saw ah I see so basically the anti-west uh, haters of BLM are joining mm -hmm. uh, like they didn't before the you know the anti-west Hamas demonstrators all of this where does this leave this country you know people say how come you know, you, you say, where have you been mm -hmm. all this time when you say how come that there are these people saying this on our street how come they been where do you think these people have come from? I mean, so, the level of frustration one feels. Mm. So I think, look, this week we've seen uh, three very monumental examples of what you just said, Peter. We've seen, uh, obviously, the, the street protests on our streets. Mm. We've also seen uh, the conviction of a failed asylum seeker 
uh, who was living in England, mm. but he's been convicted and sent to jail in, in Belgium, mm. who's alone uh, responsible for uh, importing around 10,000 illegal economic migrants mm. on dinghies into India. He lived in London. He lived in London. Yes, Indeed. he lived in Lewisham, actually. He lived in Lewisham. And he's Lewisham been is in South East London. South South East London. Yeah. And he's been sent to jail in Belgium today because a lot of his, his apparatus of, of mm. organization was based in Belgium and, and the north, north coast of France. But he was a failed asylum seeker. Mm. Uh, the shootings we saw in, in Brussels, as you were saying earlier, Raf, uh, that man was a failed asylum seeker who was refused asylum by the, Bel by the Belgium, um, but refused to deport him back to his native Tunisia, mm. where the Tunisian secret service, security services knew of his, 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 his troubles. But, but more than that, I think when Jill Mortimer MP for Hartlepool spoke in Parliament today at PMQs, yes, that's mm. right about the the tragic murder of the seventy year old gentleman in Hartlepool, mm. again by a failed asylum seeker. Mm. So I think our borders need to be far more mm. secure. We don't know who's coming in. We mm. don't know where they're coming from. We don't know anything about their background. And we're and we're attacked from all sides. It's it's precisely as you say. It's it it isn't just asylum seekers it's a set of bad ideas that are constantly repackaged and constantly presented as a means of attacking our culture and our traditions so first of all we've got blm and everybody dropping to the knees and acting like lunatics then we've got gender ideology then we've got global boiling you know now we've got free palestine they're essentially all the same thing they're all an attack on the west they're an all in some way shape or form an attack on freedom, logic, and reality. So in fact, uh, actually, you know, the, what brings us home was a, a clear again on social media. You know, actually, it's one of those times when you think, "Thank goodness for social media." Mm. Actually, because mm. I mean, I'm not. I don't want to get my information from these people on the on the box. Mm. You know, and it was, you know, rings in the nose, pink hair, kind of woke creatures going around New York tearing down these kidnap mm. signs mm. Of, of little children you know, yeah. um, in london as well yes in london but, but i think they were they looked like somali or, or whatever but these were kind of white woke mm. you know and you sort of think there there is for them a natural kind of link even if they're not aware of it they mm. they feel there's a natural link they're going against what used to be called the man mm. that's mm. what they're going against Mm. Well, it's, 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 this hatred of the West, yeah. and but at its root, it's also fundamentally Marxist. Yeah, yes, yeah. But it's this clown car—I call it a clown car of identity <laughs> politics. <laughs> lurching towards the brick wall of Islamic fundamentalism, you know, and when the two clash, you know, it's turkeys for Christmas, it's queers for Palestine, it's the same thing, that it's my enemy's enemy, they really don't sit together and... and well, I always cite the, the Iranian revolution, you know, to overthrow the Tsar, you had the left-wing radicals in the university who yeah. were the democracy, pro-freedom pro people, mm -hmm. a lot, allying with the Ayatollah the and the extremists mm -hmm. to get their it's to get the their end to overthrow the Shah. Once the Shah was overthrown, of course, yeah. the students were crushed fully. Yeah, and you, know, you can easily you see the scenarios and parallels of that in our own society. I, 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 quite. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, how that situation of the, of the left and the uh, uh, Iranians still pertains, I mean, in what we're talking about. Mm. You know, in other words, no one's learning and uh, the situation doesn't appear to have moved on but on that point i was going to ask you to to by way of ending um do you think there's anything different about this do you think this will change our kind of arguments at all what's happened i think i think it already has i think um, because in this day and age i think what's happened in israel over the last two weeks is happening in a very different age to what 9 11 was mm. yeah. uh, mm. to what even 7 7 was mm. and i think even 26 11 in mumbai was in 2008 mm. it's a very different age i think a lot of people around the world are able to make up their own minds from their own information mm. and i think that's a big game changer and also don't forget um aswella breverman has been trying to make the case for the change in the refugee convention as to what defines a refugee mm -hmm. from fearing persecution to actually facing persecution. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I mean, look, otherwise the UK and the West are open to what, 780 million 
uh, self-acclaimed refugees? Yeah. Where, 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 where does it end? Uh, but also, don't forget uh, the other big game changer over the last four years, three years, has been Kashmir. Mm. So we've seen the abrogation of something called Article 370, which is basically special autonomous status for the state of Kashmir. And since uh, that has been abrogated, you've seen not one single terror attack, major terror attack uh, in Kashmir. You, you know, every fighter used to have the, the same MO of uh, what the Palestinians and, the, and Hamas used to do of slinging stones uh, at Israelis, used to have the same in Kashmir. That stopped. Mm. Economic development has come in. And you know what? Uh, it is another, another Islamic nation, mm. the UAE, mm. who has come in with hundreds and millions of dollars mm. to come into Kashmir, we're in there, to try and provide to people, say, look, you know what? It's only economic prosperity that's going to give you opportunity mm. to live mm. and run prosper. And that's what I think l uh, more is needed in the Middle East. Uh, yes, uh, in the Middle East, in Britain, I don't think it's a matter of economics at all. Mm. I, think, I think in Britain there are two things, right? One is just... As, as you've said before, it's just raw numbers. Right? There are so many of those people on the streets and there's such now a broad coalition of different types of people, including, including uh, left-wing radicals and the institutions. I think that's one thing. I think the other thing is that these people have really shown their hand, haven't they? And they are completely and utterly comfortable with essentially modern day Nazism. Yeah, they're, they're, with, with all of those things and with the cruelty that goes along with that. So I think we, on our side, we really need to up our game and make people understand the clear and present danger that is facing us because it's, it's, it's getting towards an existential threat in this country. It, it, it is. And I think we have to realise that l I think London now feels in many ways that for every wrong from around the world, mm. London feels home. Mm. And I think the laws are there. The police needs to implement them. Uh, yes, we see a lot of rhetoric coming out from the Home Office, from the Home Secretary, that everyone who's glorifying terrorism must face, must, must face the law. Well, let's see that happening. Well, yes, I mean, I've, I, I think you need to, I don't mean to be frivolous, but you need to scrap the police and start again. Mm. <laughs> Uh, seriously, I didn't have you for defund the police, no, no, Peter. No, 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 no. <laughs> but seriously, the, when you look at the way they behave, can I just take you back, without wishing to restart the whole thing again, to last week mm. when the people went there and and in their thousands actually outside the Israeli embassy. Mm. You have to remember that Israel had not even had the chance to retaliate at mm. that point. Exactly, exactly. And exactly. yet somehow the police were standing there. These police, who basically turn up you know, to basically uh, uh, a hateful tweet about you know, someone being misgendered or whatever, stand and listen to that, you yeah. know, and somehow or other tolerate it. They mm. tolerate the intolerable. That's what they do. Yeah. And I think that, so when you say that the law must be enforced, we've got to face, I think, that the law is not enforced. Mm. It is the police that are rotten mm. in well, this And, and let's case. be clear, sub expressing support for Hamas is a criminal offence yes. with a penalty of up to 14 years in prison. Mm. And when you do have five police descending on some poor old man who's retweeted a harmless poem, I think the, the police have to be seen to be uh, acting without fear or favour. Mm. And anyone who took part in those protests or was on social media protesting, spewing that venom, should face the full force of the law. Otherwise, yes, it does make a mockery of the police. Right. But to go back to the, to the point that, you know, you, you, the question you asked, <clears throat> look, strength is in numbers. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen is with the increasing numbers of people in, in this country who are, who are uh, radicalized, you've got more confidence. And you're seeing that confidence being expressed every year. Mm -hmm. It's becoming greater and greater. And the more they express that confidence, the more they feel they can go even further the next time. And it's the increasing strength and extremity, extremism in the reaction to every news story that I find to be most disturbing. And we had, we had a chap on here, Academic Agent on Deprogrammed, our, our other show with, yes. uh, and he said that disorganize, the organized minority is always victorious over the disorganized majority. Every revolution has just been one organized minority replacing another organized minority. That's what we really need to wake up to. I think also, and also you don't even need to have a revolutionary mindset because the people that are the institutions that you will be taking over are on your side to begin with. Mm. You know, that's mm. Thank you very much, Emma. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank thank you very much. much. Again, Philip. Um, on that note, uh, we will...
doubt to be returning to this next week. Um, and uh, but in the meantime, um, do you remember that date of Hull on the twenty uh, fourth of October? And we shall see you again soon. Thank you. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember, to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.